A reading indeed from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 29. Listen now for the word of the Lord. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles, and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the court officials, the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the artisans and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand Elisha, son of Jephthah, and Gemariah, son of Hilkiah, whom King Zedekiah of Judah sent to Babylon to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives, have sons and daughters, Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we begin a word today from the, um, well, from Charlie Brown and Lucy. Charlie Brown is walking down the road with his head down as we see him so many times. And he heads towards Lucy's psychiatric help booth. And he says, and so I can't help it. I feel lonely and depressed. This is ridiculous, responds Lucy. You should be ashamed of yourself, Charlie Brown. You've got the whole world to live in. There's beauty all around you. There are things to do, great things to be accomplished, she says. And she's getting work out, worked up here. No man trods this earth alone. We are all together, one generation taking up where the other generation has left off. Charlie Brown looks brighter. He says, you're right, Lucy. You're right. You have made me see things differently. I realize now that I am part of this world. I am not alone. I have friends. And Lucy, in a typical Lucy moment, fires back, name one. (laughs) Lucy certainly is unsettling and disorienting, isn't she, for Charlie Brown? And he doesn't really need help being disoriented or unsettled. He's already got that covered but, but just in case, she's going to help him in that direction. And, and honestly, there is much, isn't there, to, uh, to disorient us these days. There are many ways in which we, we might feel uh, in distress or confused or needing hope or needing uh, clarity. Uh, we have political instability, to say the least, and division. Uh, we have violence and shootings and um, things that concern us around us in the world uh, And then, uh, you know, unrest in in Hong Kong this week, spilling over into controversy in the NBA of all places, right? We don't need to look far uh, around us to feel confusion, disorientation. Our passages today are all about disorientation all about uh, being unsettled and confused and alienated and out of our element, out of place. Jeremiah 29, the words uh, sent 
in a letter from Jeremiah who's left behind in Jerusalem when everyone else, almost everyone else, was taken into exile by the Babylonian Empire. Talk about disorder. The exiles are living disorder. That is their experience. This wasn't what was supposed to happen to them. This wasn't how things were supposed to be. But here they are. And then we have Jesus. In the story of the cleansing of ten lepers, we have Jesus who is traveling through a region of disorder, really. He's going from Galilee, his, his, his home area, right, where he came from, towards Jerusalem, and he travels through Samaria. Now, if you know the geography, you know the history, you might be aware that good Jews usually went around Samaria. They didn't go through Samaria. Jesus goes into that sort of place of disorder and he encounters ten lepers. These are individuals who are not only sick, not well, but they are ostracized by society. They are living in disorder all by themselves. There is disorder in our lives and we might be able to empathize with these people, empathize with the exiles, empathize with the Samaritans, empathize with these lepers when we feel judgment or when we feel like we're left out or when we feel like life isn't the way we imagined it or the way that it was supposed to turn out at this point. There's so much going around, on around us that can feel disorienting, that can cause unrest or worry or anxiety or confusion or despair, or helplessness. What is that for you right now? Pastor Dennis Sanders, though he doesn't use the term disorientation, he's talking about that when he says in uh, this week's Gospel text, and this is from your commentary section in your bulletins, uh, Jesus is on his way to meet his, face, his fate on the cross in Jerusalem, and ten men approach and ask him to have mercy on them. They are lepers seeking healing at the border between clean and unclean. They don't want to be on the unclean side. They want, they need to be healed. They are tired of people, uh, of being separated from family and friends, and then Jesus shows up at the border. We live in a time when people want to put up walls on our various literal and figurative borders. These borders are supposed to determine who is on the right side and who isn't. We don't want to mix things up, and we'd rather not live in a liminal state. Americans here, immigrants there, Democrats here, Republicans there, we don't want to be on the threshold of anything. We want things and people to be in their proper places. What he's saying is we want order. We want, to, we want to be able to know and understand what things are and for in that order things and people to be where they belong, where we understand them to need to be, including ourselves. And yet we live in a time of great change, great upheaval, rapid change. And for many, that causes a great amount of anxiety, doesn't it? We want order. We often want to go back to the way things were when we felt there was some order. But Jesus doesn't do that. And neither does Jeremiah. The Franciscan uh, priest, Richard Rohr, talks about a progression in our lives uh, a passing from a state of order. We begin with an understanding of how things are to be. And oftentimes when we're children, we, we, we see things clearly that way. Things are very simple, maybe simplistic even. But then life gets complicated and we see all the ways we move from order to disorder. We see how things didn't work out the way that we thought they should. We see that things do get messy and difficult. And there are lots of gray areas that are hard to navigate through. But if we wrestle through that and prayerfully look for where God is leading us, we can go to a place of reorder. Walter Brueggemann similarly called it uh, orientation 
uh, disorientation, reorientation. Other theologians have talked about a similar progression. We see it in the Bible when, when we have Jesus, God, living amongst us and then dying on the cross and then resurrected again. It's a process by where we go through these times of disorder that we'd rather not go through. But we come through on the other side with new life and new ways of seeing things. That is, that is, if we can avoid the desire that's so strong to just go back where we were. That desire that paralyzes or stymies us. Because sometimes we can go back but often we can't. The exiled Judites wished they could go back. They just wanted to go back. And they had prophets telling them, yes, God's sending you back home. It's going to happen soon. Then comes a word from Jeremiah. No, you'll get to come back but it's not happening soon. Build houses where you are. Live in them. Plant crops. Eat them. Marry your sons and daughters. Seek the welfare of the city. Yes, even the, the, the conquering Babylonians seek their welfare because in their welfare will be your welfare because you're going to be there a little while. We don't always want to hear that, do we? We'd rather just go back. They wanted to go back. They wanted to go back to the orderly life, to the way things were supposed to be, but they're stuck in this disorder. God doesn't say no. God says not yet. And by the time that the that the Judites would get to go back to Jerusalem. There would be great advances in their culture, great advances in their theology. A lot of their scriptures that previously were just passed down orally from generation to generation would be written down. This was an amazing time of reorder for them. But it wasn't always easy. And then we have Jesus who encounters those lepers, those ten lepers. Uh, They could have been uh, a a mix. They they obviously, apparently were a mix of Galileans and Samaritans. Samaritans, you may remember, were very much looked down upon uh, by good Jews because they were a people who had been... uh, they had been taken over and, and acquiesced to other religions, and there were a mix of different cultures and religions, and so Jews who were, saw themselves as being of a pure faith looked down upon them. And anyway, these, these ten lepers, they're in living disorder, right? I mean, they're, they're looked at as unclean. And I'm sure it was uncomfortable and painful what they were going through, just physically, but then they were also unclean and ostracized and left out by society. And so Jesus comes along and he has mercy on them and he heals them. And he heals them by telling them, go show yourselves to the priests. Now they would have known what he meant. You would only go to the priest. You would only even see a priest if you were, if you were made clean. But you had to go to the priest to declare you were clean to then be welcomed back into society. Do you see that? They're in disorder. They're they're being told to go back to the priests who maintained the religious order so that they could go back to an orderly life. You see that? But there's one who sees that there's something greater than that right in front of him. And he goes back not to the priest, but to Jesus. See, he's not looking backwards at what his life should have been all this time or what he wanted to get into now that he finally could. He's looking ahead at what God wants to do for him. He goes back to thank Jesus, to worship at his feet. And Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Your faith, 
The other nine, they didn't have the same faith. They were looking backwards. This one was looking at the one who healed him. And he was ready, ready for something new in Christ. Now, I don't know about you, this is, this is a big... Uh, this, this, this is a big time of year for sports. There's college football all day yesterday and uh, baseball playoffs. I, I watched a good bit of sports yesterday. Sports is an exercise in order, isn't it? I mean, there, there are clear rules in the game. There's a playing field that's lined. It's very orderly. Players know when they're supposed to come in and go out. And, and things are supposed to... We don't necessarily know who's going to win, but things are supposed to follow a certain progression. All this is great except something totally different happened in a softball game some years ago. This is a college softball game, and uh, from the news story, there were two runners on base and a strike against Sarah Tchaikovsky um, of Western Oregon University uh, when she uncorked her best swing and did something that she'd never done in high school or college. She hit a home run, which should have won the game. But it appeared to be the shortest of dreams come true, continues the article, when she missed first base, turned around to touch the base, and collapsed with a knee injury. Can you imagine that? It's your first home run and it's to win a ball game and you have an injury rounding the bases. She crawled back to first base, but she couldn't get up and, and, and run on. And the first base coach uh, told her she'd be called out if her teammates tried to help her. None of her teammates could help her limp around the bases, and it couldn't count as a run unless she could get around the bases. The umpire told her uh, that a pinch runner could be called for her, but then it, the home run would, would only become a single, and, and she'd have to stay on first base, and the game would have to go on. Then, only then, Members of the Central Washington, this is the opponent, Central Washington University softball team, stunned spectators by carrying Tchaikovsky uh, around the bases Saturday so that the three-run homer could count, an act that contributed to their own elimination from the playoffs. Central Washington first base uh, Mallory Holtman, herself the career home run leader in the Great Northwest Atlantic Conference, asked the umpire if she and her teammates could help Tchaikovsky. The umpire said there was no rule against it. Can you picture this? So Holtman and shortstop Liz Wallace put their arms under Tchaikovsky's legs, and she put her arms over their shoulders. The three headed around the base paths, stopping to let Tchaikovsky touch each base with her good leg. The only thing I remember, she said, is that Mallory asked me which leg was the one that hurt. I told her it was my right leg, and she said, okay, we're going to drop you down gently, and you need to touch the base with your left leg. We didn't know, Wallace said Wednesday, we didn't know that she was a senior or that this was her first home run. We just wanted to help her. Holtman said she and Wallace weren't thinking about the playoff spot and didn't consider the gesture something others wouldn't do. As the trio reached home plate, Tchaikovsky said the entire Western Oregon team was in tears. And in the end, Holtman, this is the first base uh, who, who kept carrying around, it is not about winning and losing so much. It was about this girl. She hit it over the fence and was in pain. She deserved a home run. Can you imagine being in that crowd and seeing that? Cheering on uh, the, 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 this, this beautiful gesture, even though it would eliminate the team that you cheer for from the playoffs. The home crowd responded with a standing ovation. And, and again, according to the rules of the game, Tchaikovsky could have, she could have gone backwards. I mean, she's clearly in disorder here, in pain, right? She could have gone backwards... Um, she could have had a pinch runner take her place, but then she would have only had a single, and it wouldn't have won the game. And she could have remained in disorder there on the ground, but no, instead, she had, 
She had strangers, really, help her through. They imagined a better way, a third way. It wasn't where she was. It wasn't where she had been in the, according to the rules of the game or going back to what the rules say was possible. It was finding a new way. And I believe God is always doing something new. Something new. So that the unimaginable can happen. Where the sick are healed, the unclean are welcome. Outsiders are used to fulfill God's purposes in the world. God's people learn that God is with them even when the unthinkable happens. And life comes forth from death. What new things is God wanting to do in your life, your heart, if only you'll let God? What are the places of disorientation that God wants to use in your spirit to take you to a new place rather than yearning for what may have been? God is always doing something new so that the unimaginable can happen. Amen.